Good, good. And one more thing. Come on. There we are. All right, ladies and gentlemen, an extended Louis B. Free radio show, Brain Food from the Heartland. I am honored to have joining me this, I always want to say this morning, this afternoon, Dr. Jacob Dykstra. Doc, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you. I'm truly and honored. I'm sorry. And your listeners, I said. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I want to talk, obviously, a lot about uh, the protests tomorrow, the information that will be given out tomorrow, understanding at St. Elizabeth Hospital, uh, the Youngstown Hospital, if you're listening out of the area, St. Elizabeth, and uh, it will be at 1045 till noon tomorrow. Oops. Oh, boy. Sorry. Ah. Eight animals. And we've got that linked up at louisfreeshow.com, wfmj.com, et cetera, et cetera. First, let's talk a little bit about you, Doc. Tell us about your background, if you would, please. Well, um, my background goes back almost 60 years when I started medical school. Uh, so that's a long time. Uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands. Uh, I came to Cleveland. Uh, actually Cleveland Heights when I was 17 oh. uh, as a foreign exchange student at Cleveland Heights High School. That's how I got the connection with Cleveland. I met my wife there um, at the high school who then came with me to Holland and we spent 17 years there. She did her studies there. I did my studies there. And then we came back to Cleveland. And um, at that time, I started at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. At that time, I stopped. What was it like for the, being an exchange student and coming? Oh, that was, that was, was that wonderful. Like? That was wonderful. I came from a very small village near the German border in, in the Netherlands, a small town, a small uh, uh, agricultural uh, farming town, a village actually, 3,000 people, or mm -hmm. whole high school, five grades had 100 students. So there were about 30. 13 in my grade. And oh. then I came to Cleveland Heights High School where they had something like 2,700 students. So that was quite a Big change. Difference. Yeah. It, it was exciting, yes. How were you received by the other students? Oh, wonderful. Beautiful. Wonderful. Oh, I'm so glad. You know, wonderful. It was I, it was I and, and a student from Finland, a, woman, a girl from Finland. And uh, we were, yeah, celebrities almost there. So that was wonderful. Yeah. And then if you continue, so you met your wife. Yep. Tell us a she little played, bit more. Well, right away in the music department, I played clarinet and she played flute. Oh, wow. And my experience started out with training for the marching band right after I arrived in Cleveland Heights. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Do you still play? Uh, not anymore. I, uh, I haven't been playing... Uh, the clarinet anymore at this point no no because your my wife, wife still my wife still plays the flute but i don't play anymore. that's wonderful that's that's wonderful so uh tell us a little bit about your your career in medicine well it has been a long career i must say i um in uh, 1974 my wife and i came back to cleveland for two years and uh, i was always wanted to, to become a dermatologist, but it was pretty tough to get into a residency. I had long waiting periods. So at that time, um, I came to Cleveland Heights. My wife was very pregnant at the time with her first daughter. And uh, I thought I could walk into a residency here just like that, didn't work out. So I took a job at uh, Metro Health as a, uh, a OBGYN resident, got a lot of surgical training there. And uh, later on, a year later, I went to um, uh, university hospitals here in Cleveland uh, for a year of anesthesiology training. And then I went back to the Netherlands and did my dermatology residency over there. Then I came back over here again and did another couple of years at the Cleveland Clinic in dermatology. And I finally finished up my training career. So it took, it took a while. 
and then but, I stayed on as staff at the Cleveland Clinic. And enjoyed it, yeah? Oh, very much, very much. It was a great place to work, yes. I, I've got to say again, the Cleveland Clinic, um, I'm so grateful that we have the clinic so close. Um, especially, and I don't want to get into a lot with my diagnosis last year and to be able to have the clinic again as close as it is and and great departments there and wonderful people and um it's it's wonderful to be this close to the cleveland clinic yeah oh yeah yeah well we live i live walking distance away from it so walking distance well <laughs> it's about a yeah almost an hour and a half for me but that's yeah, right. walking yeah. distance yeah <laughs> wow that's great so, and then let's talk a little bit about Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. I go way back with them. I remember having Dr. Neil Barnard on, oh, very early in my radio days. Uh -huh. uh, and he's been on a number of times. And I'm a, a big fan supporter of uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Your connection. Well, my connection is really as, as a member, a long-term long, long -term member, I became a member probably sometime in the mid 90s more than 25 years ago which yeah uh, yeah going 25 yeah. 28 years something like that uh i actually got into it by chance um the um i was shopping here at the food co-op and they had a little stencil there about the physicians committee and i i read it and i said well that's interesting so i contacted them and i became a member and have been a member ever since they are a very ethical high standard type of organization they have about seventeen thousand uh, physician members and a lot more non-physician members it's a big organization and indeed neil barnard has done an excellent job in building this oh, up yeah yeah and it was it was very different back then you know it's uh, when i think about how things have changed over well the last quarter century the last 25 years if you will how things have changed and the awareness and the awareness that physicians committee for responsible medicine has brought um literally around the world and the again the, the deep awareness but back then uh, probably was especially for physicians kind of difficult getting through Yes. To, to, to everybody, to physicians, et cetera, correct? Yeah, yeah it was. And uh, But uh, Neil Barnard has done an excellent job in, in slowly making people aware, particularly in the medical community also. And that's why they grew out to 17,000 members now, which is uh, physician members, that is, and a, a lot more uh, non-physician members. So it's not just physicians. And, you know, they stand for... Uh, high standards in medical research, in medical education, but also in general in patients' health and particularly with nutrition to improve uh, improve their health. Because as you may know, about 70% of all our diseases are diet related. You know, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm, I'm laughing because I have a dear friend who once I had my, and I've talked about my diagnosis before. I'm not going to belabor it, but I had my diagnosis. He said, so you stopped eating meat when you were in high school in 1970. I said, that's correct. And so over 50 years ago, I said, and you went vegan 20 some years ago. I said, that's correct. And I eat a whole foods, whole foods, uh, plant-based diet. I exercise. I, <laughs> and it's like, I had to get the thing that diet, didn't couldn't prevent doesn't prevent <laughs> he just teases me about how you know i would wouldn't avoided dyes you know uh, artificial flavorings and artificial mm -hmm. dyes but the diet as you know much better than i a lot of people and i've had heard from a lot of people over the years that have done so much better when they changed their their diet and lifestyle yeah definitely well i tell you honestly uh the only reason i'm capable of sitting with you here today uh, is because about 30 years ago, I went on a whole food plant-based diet. Mm. And uh, there were multiple reasons for that. But to my big surprise, it uh, lowered my cholesterol 
from a whopping 385, and you may be familiar with cholesterol, I've never seen it that high in my patients, completely normalized to 150. Wow. So, yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I should have been dead a long time ago, right? That's fantastic, though. You made that, again, that, the lifestyle, the, the diet change. Um, I have a friend, actually, it was a co-worker, actually owned some radio stations I worked for, a number of years ago, I was that had high cholesterol and was able to convince this person to at least try, try taking mm -hmm. taking a lot of meds, a lot of cholesterol lowering medications, etc., and has normalized her cholesterol levels. She's seventy, I don't know, seventy two, seventy three. Well, I'm 77. I'm still going. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. it's wonderful. It's wonderful what you can do. Yep. And with it all the problems of diabetes, the obesity, the problems, you know, I have empathy for people, but you you got to want to change. You got to want to do something. You want to be proactive and taking all the drugs. I'm not, again, people have choices to make, but that's, we all know there's side effects to drugs and there's other things and start with your diet and your lifestyle, Absolutely. right? Doc, you're the expert here, not me. Sorry. I couldn't agree. Right. I couldn't agree more with you. Yep. Yeah. And, it's hard and, to convince people, but I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah, it, it is sometimes. It is. I think it's getting. Just be on that for a minute. To, it's getting, much better, much more accepted. My concern, and I'm I'm thrilled for the animal welfare that the products are out there, but they are processed foods, um, and I eat them once in a while, but I don't eat them regularly. You know the different meats, the hamburgers or whatever, uh, you know, yeah, but I, I love to cook and that's where I get my, my yeah. nutrition from. Not again, it's nice to enjoy once in a while. Of course I enjoy them once in a while, but not as a staple. So I'm glad on, for the animal welfare and the environmental impact okay. that yeah. these products are out there. And it's just, it's wild for me to go into a store like for you, I'm sure Dr. Dykstra, you go into a store and you see like vegan sections. Yeah, that's like there's right. There's a chain, a small chain in this area. So like, I think four four stores, they've got a vegetarian and vegan section. It's like, well, it's everywhere. <laughs> it is. It's become much more popular now. That's for sure. And 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 it's true. You know, we, we may occasionally have one of these processed uh, vegan products, but overall... Um, the best thing is a whole plant-based yeah. uh, uh, diet. And uh, once in a while, you have to, you can easily do it. But you shouldn't have every day, though, all just processed, uh, vegan, even vegan foods. Uh, and the interesting thing is the the other day, now, I come from a background uh, in terms of being a vegan. Uh, starting out 30 years ago with my older daughter. We have two daughters. And she said at a certain point, uh, I'm going to become a vegetarian. She was about 16. And as a physician, physicians know nothing, by the way, most physicians know nothing about food and nutrition because we just don't get, get it properly in medical school. Uh, as a physician, I said, oh my God, the girl's going to die, right? Yeah. Well, I took her to the dietitian at the Cleveland Clinic and the dietitian later told me, she's doing just fine, whatever she is doing. And uh, to her credit, and at that time, I slowly became more aware of nutrition. I became slowly aware of uh, the animal uh, uh, animal welfare tissues, uh, issues, etc. So, you know, that uh, dates back a long time, but everybody goes through that. I always have to compare that to what uh, the great philosopher Gandhi said, you know, whenever there's a new idea, uh, people first ignore you, right? Then they make fun of you. Yes. Right? yes. Next stage, they get angry with you. And the last stage is they accept what you had to say. Yeah. It take, it it's takes a process. Yeah, I, it's I a agree. process. Right. I agree. When I, when I, I think I was 16, almost 17, when I stopped eating, I always say when I stopped eating flesh, when I became vegetarian, my mother was the same way. I had to go to the doctor and get blood work they you know and again that culture yeah, yeah, yeah. i get it it's like and i didn't i was a kid i didn't know much about 
nutrition. I didn't know anything about nutrition, actually, to be honest. I learned a lot very quickly. Um, but it is, yeah, yeah, my mom thought I was going to die. Also. <laughs> I, yeah, it's just because how do you do that? And it was, it was interesting, very, very different today with all the resources and many of them provided by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And they've got a, a wealth of information. So your daughter, can tell me the progress with her? Is she... Oh, well, hey, she's much older now. This was in 1992 or so, 1991. Yeah. We're talking a long time ago. Yeah, no, the whole family turned uh, vegetarian, vegan. Hey, oh, that's and, wonderful. Uh, that's what the way we've been. And we're still around. So, you know, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That is great. But I agree with you. How you know, a boy in high school, 16-year-old boy in high school not eating meat. Um oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I did I get made fun of a lot? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the whole real men eat meat and stuff like yeah. what's odd to me is again, now 50 plus years without eating meat, I was introduced by a mutual friend to an, another guy that actually, and he said, oh, he said, you know, you were, we were talking about meat and vegetarian or vegan, whatever. So Louis, Louis's been since he was in high school or something like that. This guy still, and still asked, so where do you get your protein? Yeah, and right. I'm thinking, and I was respectful yeah. because he asked respectfully. He yeah. asked respectfully. It wasn't, it was like, oh, right here. And I'm thinking, pal, I'm, I've done this for 50 years. I'm standing in front of you. I'm upright. I mean, obviously yeah. I'm getting it somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So well, I think, I think what is showing there also is that in general, people don't get enough information about nutrition uh, in schools. Also, I think there should be much more education about nutrition, considering that, you know, nutrition is, is one of the first primary health care issues and uh, if people would understand a little bit where protein comes from, you know, and get an education, then it would be much easier to understand. I mean, I understand the question uh, from people they, because they associate that so much with just protein. But yeah. <laughs> heck, I, uh, I still lift my weights and I still do my sit-ups and uh, <laughs> I still have plenty of protein in my body. Yeah, yeah that's too I. <laughs> that's too I. Yeah. You, you're, so your involvement goes way back with Physicians Committee for Responsible yeah. Medicine. And I know there's going to be a Save the Animals um, tomorrow. Again, it's tomorrow at St. E, St. Elizabeth Hospital from 1045 till noon. And I've got all the information, all the information posted. It's near the main entrance of St. E's. Uh, so you'll be able to find everybody quickly and easily. Tell us the issue about this, the, the animal testing and the issue, if you would. Okay. Um, the reason that we're uh, protesting there is, is simply because uh, St. Elizabeth Hospital is... About this. Belongs to a sort of... Excuse me? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. St. Elizabeth Hospital belongs to a shrinking minority of uh, institutions that still uses pigs for their surgical training. Now, it should be clear to anybody who's listening uh, that the anatomy of a pig is not the anatomy of a human being, number one. Uh, number two, um, these courses are given in the summer and to the uh, residents, surgical residents, uh, and they cut into a pig once, do all the procedures, and then they kill the pig. And, you know, you hardly get any repetition of training that way. And that's why the vast majority of uh, surgical residencies in this country have shifted over to non-animal testing methods, more modern testing methods. And I think the most uh, common one are the human-like simulators, which not only have complete human anatomy, but they're not just a piece of plastic. They are, they have lifelike tissue like uh, skin, muscle, fat, organs. They can bleed, they can breathe, they have a heartbeat. So um, they are much better for training surgeons. And the most important thing is you can use these simulators 
over and over again. And the hallmark of proper surgical training is really to do a procedure repeatedly over and over again in order to become good at it. And with a pig, you can't do that. I mean, you do it once or twice and that's it. So um, I'm really surprised that they haven't joined the overwhelming 80% of all the surgical residencies in this country now use the non-animal uh, methods for training the surgeons. Uh, in particular, the Cleveland Clinic, obviously, and but also places like Harvard, Stanford, University of Michigan, uh, and and many more. So I'm not sure why Saint Elizabeth is yeah. holding out. I I'm not either. And you think 2023, and when you're naming, the, you know, the other hospitals and how they're doing it, um, I don't know either. Do you, I, do I got to ask? Do you have any theories of why they're still doing this? cruel and unnecessary i mean we know for the, yeah. it, you know, I cannot, the pigs aren't humans but yeah, go ahead i i cannot comment on the motivation of uh, the surgery program at st yeah. elizabeth myself but you know over the years i've noticed that can range between pure complacency like uh, we've always done it this way we'll just this continue way. you know to all the other way on the other side of the spectrum follow the money you know that sometimes there's yeah, money involved, uh, jobs involved, just ch stuff like that. Um, but I'm not sure what the, the motivation for St. Elizabeth is. And what is so unusual, I find, is that uh, they do it. I mean, uh, Neomet, the Northeastern Ohio uh, Medical University, has uh, several affiliated hospitals, and, uh, and a couple of them, like uh, Akron General and uh, Summa Health, do not use animals in their training. So I'm not sure why St. Elizabeth is still doing it at this point, to tell you the truth. And that's unfortunately the reason that we have to go up there and, and do some protesting. Yeah, and I, I'm hoping to see a lot of you all out there tomorrow, again, tomorrow morning. Be there. Everybody know, Everybody in this area, certainly in the broadcast area, knows where a St. Elizabeth's Hospital is. If it's called the downtown or up on the north side of Belmont. Everybody knows where it's at. It's, it's and, right it, there at uh, Park Park Avenue Park and Avenue. North Avenue. Yeah, so it's very easy, very easy to uh, to find it, very easy to get to. There's bus service up there, et cetera. And signs will be available so people can get them there. And there's easy parking, I understand. There's a parking garage right across. So It's easy, and people need to go. You need to show... Let them know, reverberate the voices that we've got to end this. I, I get, like when you were saying, like pigs, pigs aren't humans. I, I, you know, clearly that if you can do it on a pig, doesn't mean you can. It translates to a human. And when you're saying about how the, I mean, I know with the drug trials, you know, when they do animal testing, I believe it was, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Doctor Dykstra, but the I believe 90% that pass in animal tests fail in human trials. It's actually 95%. 95, wow. Yep, 95%. And then, you know, uh, the, the few that do pass, uh, once they get on the market, sometimes have to be pulled off. Yeah. Or they have to... They show even more side effects. They have after what is called after marketing side effect. So it is, it's a mi miserable uh, ratio of that kind of, of failure. Uh, and the interesting thing is also um, that a few years ago, the uh, National Institute of Health, the NIH, um, stopped using chimpanzees for testing. And if there is one animal that is the closest related to the human being genetically is the, sh the chimpanzee. So they didn't even think it was necessary to do jokes anymore. So why would you use a dog or a cat that is even farther away from a human being? So it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And I would urge people, um, if certainly read Franz de Waal's book, uh, Mama's Last Hug, but go on YouTube and there's, I believe it's somewhere between three and five minute video of mama's last hug and if that doesn't impact you if that doesn't I, i'm getting teary-eyed just thinking about the video of the connection the connection with humans and the relationships and to think about 
experimenting on these creatures. It's just, it's horrifying. It's horrifying. So. But for instance, tomorrow at, at uh, trying to switch St. Elizabeth, Elizabeth over to the uh, highly sophisticated human models. You know what the interesting thing is? Neomed, uh, the Northeastern Ohio Medical University, has an excellent state-of-the-art simulation center available where these residents can go to and, and practice. So I'm not sure why they're not being used. It's called the Wasson Center, as I understand. Um, tomorrow I'll be wearing two hats, actually. My one hat is the physician's hat. I'm, I like to make sure that in this country, the surgical residents get all the opportunities to learn as well as, as they can. And uh, on the simulators, that is much better than doing it on uh, uh, on a pig. You know, you can simulate. Let's say you want to become a pilot. You test in a flight simulator. You don't learn flying yeah. by flying a. a, a, a yeah, just you know, going you for can, it. You're just right, going right, for it, right? right. So um, I, I I hope that we can convince them to do this. You know that that is my physician. If if a doctor wants to refer a patient for surgery, he wants that surgeon to be optimally trained. And if if a doctor doesn't feel comfortable with a surgeon, you know, then that's a bad referral. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I can put my human hat on just like you do, and say, you know, why kill an animal if there's absolutely no need for no it? No reason. Yeah. You know, if there's no reason. Yeah. Absolutely no reason. And it's just it's why like the like the the uh, the drug tests like the tests the animal tests with with the drugs and like you said corrected me ninety five percent fail and again I say respectfully to the, the drug companies um, you know they I'm not going to say which I think are ethical or which I think are not which advertise too much and which aren't but they you know they they need humans to try it I'm actually um, Trying to get into a, a trial, a drug trial now. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. What do I have to lose? And if it helps someone else, if it helps me, great. If it helps someone down the road, great. People have to be willing to volunteer for those also. Plus, on the other hand, you also now have, I mean, there are researchers who are sophisticated and smart, and they are developing much better testing methods, like uh, through 3D printing uh, organs, through oh. uh, yeah. chips to sell your cultures the problem is we need to fund those much more i mean there, there are much better ways i compare it to trying to reach the moon you can try it in a weather balloon and that's not very helpful or you can try to <laughs> do it in a rocket you know in a, yeah. in a spaceship and uh, that's where we are right now there are so many sophisticated new modern i mean if we live in the age of i artificial intelligence, we should be able to change this just as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned artificial intelligence. Do you have, I, I've had a lot of concerns. I, in fairness, I don't have a wealth of knowledge. There was a great uh, issue of my favorite publication, favorite periodical, the New Scientist out of the UK. And, and I've got concerns from what little I know. And then I had uh, a friend that uses it and we had talked and he showed me on his phone and i'm thinking eh, maybe i shouldn't be so paranoid he showed me some quick things that he did and it was pretty amazing mm -hmm. so, any thoughts on ai well i must admit uh i am not an expert on artificial intelligence and i actually uh, and i've heard the, the pros and the cons also and uh, i think it's one of the reasons that the uh Writers' Union in California is uh, on strike because yeah. of the artificial intelligence stealing all their work uh, and, and their faces and, and everything. Uh, so I am not an expert in that field either, but um, I have asked that question actually to the research people at PCRM, at the Physicians Committee, and um, uh, they, they emailed me and said, we're actually looking into it right now to find out what artificial intelligence can do for further uh, healthcare, drug development, et cetera. So 
it's a whole new field, a young field, and uh, I'm I'm sure you can't stop it once it's yeah. the genie is out of the bottle. Right. You can't stop it, but uh, it it can be led into proper channels. I'm sure. When uh, uh, again thinking of it, and again I can't uh, attest the accuracy of my memory these days, uh, but I believe I read an article within the last couple of months of AI. One of my big concerns is. Um, anti antibiotic resistance, antimicrobial mm -hmm. resistance, and they, I believe, AI came up with a, a medicine, a prescription, something for a certain, a very specific type of antibiotic resistance for that um, bacteria. Mm -hmm. And if that's you know, if it can develop. I, I I don't know how it works. Believe me, <laughs> you're I, I haven't heard of that smarter specific. than I am. But no, no. wow, if that's yeah. the case, yeah, yeah, exactly. If you lead it in the correct channels, then uh, in the wrong hands, it will be disastrous. Of I'm course, sure, but yeah. in the right hand, yes, absolutely. Like everything, right? Yeah, like, like everything. Like everything. Like everything. I am talking with Dr. Jacob Dykstra. Uh, we talk about a lot of things. We're talking about everything, and uh, specifically about the protest tomorrow at St. E's, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, uh, tomorrow morning, 1045 till noon at St. E's. The, getting this with, again, you've been with PCRM for like three and a half decades. Two and, Get, and a half. Two and a half, I'm sorry. I think somewhere in, the mid, somewhere in the mid 90s, I think, yeah. Thank it's going you, on three. About that. Going on three. We, yeah, no, it's going on three decades almost, yeah. And to see it now, again, we touched on this earlier, Dr. Dykstra, but to see it now and seeing the acceptance, um, it's gonna be very heartwarming to you on heartwarming and intellectually inspiring, seeing the growth. It definitely is. I have such great respect for a person like Neil Barnard to develop. Yeah, great guy. Pretty, pretty much from scratch. And it's amazing. Uh, I on Friday afternoons they have this uh, what they call mission critical, which is a Zoom half hour Zoom uh, program with Neil Barnard and a number of people who've done some work that particular day. It's it's excellent because you can tell every week what's going on there on a Friday afternoon from two to two to two thirty, and uh, it is just amazing how that has grown and also the amount of people that sign in, not from just all over the United States, but from Europe, from Asia, from, you name it, you name the countries. Uh, they all sign in and, and listen to this, uh, this Zoom uh, uh, interaction. It's very good. And just growing from there. I think that's, that's absolutely wonderful. And again, lots of praise to Dr. Neil Bernard and lots of praise to you for being there at the, the early stages. Again, yeah. I'm yeah. aware, astute, and courageous. I'm sure, and I am not. won't ask you specifics, I'm sure some of the colleagues weren't. Oh, no. Accept that. Yeah. I'm just, no. I'm, no. Again, not, I'm not asking specifics unless you want to share somebody. No specifics. So was, yeah. Well, you could tell probably one of my, my good colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic, you may have heard of him, Caldwell Esselstein. Uh, yes, who, he's been. Yeah. He was on with me years ago in my. Oh, yeah, yeah. Career, yeah, he's yeah. excellent. Actually, uh, yeah. uh, when I was diagnosed with my outrageously high cholesterol, uh, the dietitian, to her credit, again sent me up to. I was still a resident at the clinic. Uh, sent me up to uh, Dr. Eschelstein to his office and said, "You got to talk to this man." He was just at the beginning of his research. He had not even started it yet. Wow. And uh, so he gave me all the information and uh, it was very healthy for me. That's why I'm still around. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. great finding like-minded people. Yeah, I, Absolutely. It's great because it's, it's rare back then, very rare to yeah. run into somebody. Now, again, I remember there was very few vegetarians, but <laughs> you know, you, I just remembered a couple of years after I graduated, I was invited back to talk about vegetarianism, and I actually had a uh, a film inside of a slaughterhouse, 
and I showed it in this meeting. And it was it was you know voluntary for people to come. It was something they had, you know, they had different things happening in different rooms, and you could go to what you wanted. Well, um, obviously, I was never invited back because I guess some parents got really freaked out that they let me show that. Yet I got cards of people years later that stopped eating meat then and mm -hmm. for a year had hadn't had never started again so you just never know who whose life you're going to impact yeah, and you get your perfect example of it like you said with your cholesterol yeah absolutely well, I, I i hope that will also influence your listeners a little bit who have high cholesterol and they should try it out yeah why not I, again, you I got, you got nothing to lose. I, yeah, nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's Let's right. try it. Again, I'm not, I'm obviously not a physician. I'm not recommending, suggesting anything about medication. If somebody has a cardiologist that they have faith in and they're taking medication, that's between them and their doctor. But I've, you always hear about the terrible side effects to some of the statin drugs. Sure. And, yeah that sometimes people have to increase and increase. And, you know, uh, I've always been of the mindset to take as few drugs, pharmaceuticals as possible. Yeah. These days, it's a little different. I'm, you know, doing what I can, but, you know, to minimize that is the best for the body. Correct? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh... If you don't uh, absolutely need them, then why get all the side effects? That's absolutely true. That's and if right. you can, and if you can improve significant amount of your health through through diet, yeah. then you do that. You know, go it's for it. Simple. Yeah, and you'll enjoy it. Again, I always tell people, you know, uh, try it, try it. You know, when they first came out with the meatless Mondays, I was a bit of a curmudgeon. And I was mm -hmm. like saying, oh, you know, if you're going to do it, do it. That's how I did it. I just stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not for everybody. And I get that. And they have what, no meat May and January to, to do it. I think that's great because if you do it one day a week, firstly, it's better. It's better for you. It's better for the animal welfare, better for the environment. And then you'll discover some dishes, make some things that maybe you want to try on Tuesday or Wednesday or Friday exactly. yeah. and expand it from there. I think those are, yeah. it's all great, but try it, yeah. try it. And like and you said, go ahead. The The nice thing about uh, the physicians committee also on their website, pcrm.org, um, you can sign up completely for free for um, the so-called vegetarian kickstart. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. you need to do something about three weeks before your, taste glands change to a new type of food. Was and that right? So, three weeks. Yeah, about three weeks. And that's why they do it for three weeks. And they guide you through the whole process. They 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 have people who will come communicate with you and help you out. And if you have a question, it's an excellent free program if you really because it's hard to find out what the heck am I going to do if I yeah. change over. It's not that easy. And uh that's why I certainly recommend that they just go to the website and, and, and yeah. take care of it. PCRM.org, a wealth of information at PCM PCRM.org. Uh, Dr. Dykstra, when you were saying that about a few weeks to adjust to different foods or different tastes, it reminded me of um, when I, heard I wanted to re dramatically reduce my sugar intake. This was years ago. And I started using stevia. And I remembered, and I was committed to, I was going to keep doing it um, because I knew it was better for me than, it wasn't as bad for me as the sugar. And at first, I, I was always getting a little bit of an aftertaste. It wasn't horrible, but it was a little bit of after. I could tell it wasn't sugar, just a little bit. It was, wasn't unpleasant. It just was there. And I remember talking um with Scott Anderson, who does works a lot with the microbiome and has written books, a number of books about it. He, he was talking about how the gut microbiome, when I presented that to him, changes and then 
kind of like what you're saying about getting used to it and then somehow changed again this is way way above my um intelligence grade gets in your taste buds it changes it literally the gut microbiome changes and then changes your taste buds because i don't taste it anymore i don't have the aftertaste which is great and it makes me think of what you're saying about how getting used to different foods that's right well you know i had it in the old days way before when i was still a kid and my mother switched us over from whole milk to skim milk oh my god i couldn't stand the skim milk you know and then after a while you got so used to the skim milk that if you got whole milk, you would gag, you know. <laughs> yeah. This is way back when I was still a kid, but I do, I do recall that. It's interesting. I hadn't thought of, I remember the skim milk. I yeah. remember the chain, the big <laughs> push for skim milk yeah. back then. And yeah, it's right. It's You have to adjust. And again, all the right. information at pcrm.org, pcrm.org. So again, Dr. Dykstra, uh, tomorrow, tell us again. Where and when? Uh, tomorrow at St. Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, we meet at the uh, front of the hospital. It's, as I understand, it's the intersection between Park Avenue and North Avenue. Um, and uh, starts at 1045, quarter to 11, and lasts till, till 12 o'clock. And I just heard that the weather might not be that accommodating. It might be necessary to bring an umbrella, but oh, we'll see. You know, I didn't even think to look at the weather forecast yeah okay um, obviously well, I, I don't know what it is if youngstown is just like cleveland we usually say here you don't like the weather wait 10 minutes wait yeah and then, yeah and then it will change maybe yeah. youngstown is the same way I don't yeah. oh yeah it's like yeah that's like uh, uh what is the other thing ohio where you can have all four seasons in one week it's just, <laughs> yeah. right it's just yeah that, that's it's, a good one too yeah i like that bizarre one. right yeah. you just yeah. you just never know but yeah. bring an umbrella, whatever, but be there because you certainly need the support so that we can let them know how people feel about it. And this and antiquated, go ahead. Hey, be sure and we'll take care of all the signs that we can yeah. hold up and so on. Yeah. So you just you, all you have to do is bring yourself. Bring yourself and bring a friend if you can. And bring a friend. And or a couple of friends if you can, if you will. <laughs> if you will. And again, yeah. this antiquated methods, if you can just take a couple of minutes and again and explain about the protest for those that have joined us late. Okay, uh, sure. About that. Yeah, well, it's, it, as I said before, uh, St. Elizabeth, unfortunately, is uh, still one of the few hospitals in the country, a minority that still uses pigs to um, uh, train their physicians, uh, surgeons, physicians. And uh, pigs have a completely different anatomy or physiology than human beings, so it's substandard. And you can only use them once, and then you have to kill them. So there is no good repetition of, of techniques that you can learn. And that's why the vast majority of, of surgery residencies in this country and includes, you know, highly regarded places like Harvard and Stanford, Cleveland Clinic, University of Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. They have switched over to non-animal tests, in particular, the... Um, the highly sophisticated uh, uh, simulators, which are really fantastic. I mean, if you go to the website of PCRM.org and you type in uh, in the search button uh, si simulators, you can see, and your mind will be blown away to see what kind of simulators they nowadays have. It's, it's amazing. Uh, these things have the complete human um, anatomy they have lifelike tissue that you can cut into and sew up and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they bleed, they can breathe, they can have a heartbeat. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's amazing what is available now. And, uh, and you can use them over and over again. I think that is the important thing. That's the hallmark of training a surgeon to do a procedure over and over again until you really get it, until you're good at it. And you can't do that with a pig, obviously. Yeah. And again, it's different. The, the makeup, the pigs aren't humans, humans aren't pigs. It's just, right. it doesn't, even, right. make, yep. doesn't yep. even, yeah, it doesn't even. So even if you don't care about the animal welfare, if you don't care about the slaughter of these innocent sentient beings, if you don't care, you ought to care about how the surgeons are being trained. Exactly. 
Exactly. You know, and that's mean, my honestly, that's my physician part here too. You know. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm I'm thinking, and again, I'm not criticizing any particular surgeons that, but, but if you, would you really want a surgeon that trained by doing the surgery on a pig to operate on you, do surgery on you or a loved one? No. I mean, when you think about it like that, right. it's, you know, it's insane. It is. And of course, in the final analysis, even though on the sophisticated simulators, you learn much better what to do. In the final analysis, you learn proper surgery on the human being in the operating room, provided you have a highly motivated, compassionate teacher who leads you through the process. You know, first maybe observe, then he'll let you or she'll let you hold the surgical hook, you know, keep the wound open, and then let you do a little bit of this. That's how I was trained. I never trained on a pig. And in my days, we didn't have simulators, but we have very motivated, compassionate uh, teachers who guided you through the process of becoming becoming surgically uh, capable. Yeah. And Michael says commented uh, uh, that a pluviophile. I would say I'm a pluviophile. I love the rain. Pluvio. I learned a great word a number of years ago. Pluviophile likes the sound of rain. Likes being in the rain whatever. But if you're not a pluviophile, bring an umbrella. Even if you are, you may want to bring an umbrella so you don't get soaked. But check the weather and please come out tomorrow morning. Dr. Jacob Dykstra, this has been a pleasure and an honor. It was wonderful to talk to you. Wonderful to talk with you also. So you're going to be at the at St. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I'll try to find you. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. This has been an honor. Thank you so much. Well, it was a great pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacob Dykstra. And again, we've got all those links. All of those, the links are up. So all you have to do is check out the 